Coming up on Virginia Currents, a special two-part story on addiction from the McShin Foundation. Two moms open up about their struggles with opioid addiction and how their recovery leads the way for other mothers. And see how empathy and being away from the peer pressures of school make the ride to recovery easier for teens. Also, Latina author Meg Medina joins me in the studio for Daphne's Corner. Find out why she writes about strong girls overcoming tough circumstances. Plus, the girl power and music of rising star Lucy Dacus coming up on Virginia Girls. Welcome to Virginia Currents. I'm Daphne Maxwell-Reed. Today's show will focus on an epidemic that strikes every community and people of all backgrounds and ages, drug addiction. Last year, there were approximately 900 deaths from heroin and prescription painkillers in Virginia. Heroin overdoses have tripled in the past few years. It's a drug that's easier and cheaper to get than prescription painkillers. Benzodiazepines, or benzos, like Xanax, Ativan, and Valium, can also be dangerous because it only takes a small amount to go from a safe dose to an overdose. To help conquer this battle with addiction, John Schenholzer and his wife Carol McDade founded the McShin Foundation in Henrico. It's one of the leading detox, recovery, and sober living residences in the state. McShin is based on the theory that people who are in recovery now can best help those trying to find recovery. Let's hear how two moms, the CEO of McShin and the director of female programs, crossed that bridge to recovery. My opiate addiction started with pain medication um, and ended with heroin. There just weren't enough pills to be found to squash. No, mine straight heroin. I did pain pills if I couldn't, you know, get enough money or didn't, my dude was asleep or whatever. The McShin Foundation is Virginia's leading peer-to-peer -peer recovery community organization for individuals that want to turn their life around. They want a better life without drugs and alcohol. Our motto is we heal families and save lives. All of our programs have someone that's in recovery, that lived experience. It's been in the trenches, got myself out, here's how you can do it. Who better to help a an addict seeking recovery than someone who's been there, done that, and gotten on the other side. I was with a bad herd my whole existence until I came into recovery, to be honest with you. Um, I was in school, so I would got good grades, honor roll. I, um, my disease progressed because I didn't, I never got punished. I never got, you know, anything, um, curfew. Or, I, was, I was doing a lot of stuff, don't get any ideas. But I was sneaking out my window. I was just, the lifestyle that I led at a very young age because I didn't have the structured environment like me and my husband do with our children to protect them. I would get in a lot of trouble if I did that, so I don't know how she didn't get in trouble. And if we play that tape out, Destiny, for me not getting consequences was 14 years of my life in a dump hole, pretty much. My disease is rooted in, in just insecurity, low self-esteem, self-centered fear, and um, it didn't really get out of control for me um, until college. My parents divorced. They decided to divorce when I was a junior. And my sister was calling me all the time. She could not stand being in the center of all this strife that was going on with my mom and dad and not having me there. With that and two majors and running a corps of you know, female cadets and having all these responsibilities, I just bottomed out. My roommates would come in at any given time and I would be on the floor from all the pills and the alcohol that I had taken. I thought, you know, Jesus put a baby in my belly that that would save me and stop using, but I didn't stop until she was almost five years old when I came to McShen. Um, 
she would be in foster care right now if my family didn't step up and, you know, take her, absolutely. Oxycodone made me feel like I was a better mother, like I was a better wife, like I was a better employee because it's almost like a superwoman cape that, you know, you feel like you have on. I think it started off as coping, and I think it started off as finally finding something that I could somewhat, I thought, it was a lie, but something I somewhat thought I could control. But it's like that sense of warm feeling, you know, that you get, you know, in your body and your soul. It's like you fill that void. You don't have to deal with this, deal with life. You don't have to be present. My last year of, of using was, I was living off of zebra cakes. Um, I couldn't feed her, so I left her at my mom's downstairs. We lived in an apartment complex. Because every penny, my now husband, but back then boyfriend that we had, we spent on drugs. We didn't spend on her. We didn't spend on us, clothes. We were, we were disgusting. I was sniffing the heroin. Um, at, the end of my, at the end of my addiction, I took 12 to, I had an insane tolerance to pain pills, took 12 to 15, 30 milligram oxycodone a day and about a gram of heroin on top of that. It was a supplement for me. The pain medication was no longer doing what I needed it to do. She would do it normally in our bathroom. Like, I think when I was in third grade, around there. once um, I just like, I didn't know that she was in there and I just walked in and then, um, I, I would tell them that's mommy's medicine, and I have to take it to do what I need to do, but it's dangerous and it will kill you. Once you get addicted to opiates like that, I'll get clean tomorrow. Like you, your physical feelings, the withdrawal, I would, it is diarrhea, it is kicking, it is hot and cold, it is, restless legs, it's sweating, it's just, you want to die. I mean, you really do. How do we help? We provide education, we provide housing, uh, we have a partner in the building that um, does medical detox on site. We have 85 recovery beds in this Richmond Henrico area. We have a family program, we have the youth program, you know, we have a bunch of different programs too throughout this building and throughout these years of growing. Um, so it's just important to help anyone, you know, that needs our services. I mean, we gotta protect our herd, you know. We have a very good herd and we're very good at what we do because we do have that lived experience. We can act in a deeper level than, you know, most people. I, I feel like people, recovery, um, especially as women, I feel like there's just a bond there. When you have someone who's lived it and who has gone through it or is currently going through it to say it is going to be okay, you know, and it's okay to take some time for yourself to get yourself better so you can be a better parent for your child. Um, that's, it was invaluable for me. She's about to have two years and she hasn't had the relapse once, so I'm just really proud. I tell her a lot of stuff about like drama and everything and like I mean we hang out a lot and like we have some mom and daughter bonding. Because of recovering the tools that I've gotten and instilled in me I'm able to have these open conversations with her about all kinds of different things. Like I don't shove stuff under the rug and hope it goes away anymore. Our prevention piece in our home is to show her the realness of what drugs can do to you. That is our prevention, is recovery. The inside love that I have for myself that I'm able to instill in her as a woman to be respectful and kind and patient and loving and caring, and it's because of recovery, not just because I don't do drugs anymore. You have to work a program of recovery and, and continually work it. And it's a difficult transition. It's one I had to take slowly and still take slowly. Um, but, you know, just being able to 
be there and just spend time with them and not the hurry, 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 you know. Um, I mean, it's more about them now. The time I spend with them is quality time before I, I was there in person, but not really in spirit. Do you see your mom as a role model? Yeah. She a good example. Especially for other people who are um, starting to recover. We own homes, we have our kids back, you know, we, we run companies, like, you know, yes, we have the disease of addiction, but from that disease made us be able to be the mommies, the wives, you know, the, the, the women that we're our today helping other people. So our stories are hope. Another program of the McShin Foundation is the McShin Academy which helps students gain their education and therapy without the temptation of drug-using peers at their schools. The program relies on candor and conversation. It's led by young adults who just walked the same paths as the students and was founded by someone who used to be the boy next door. I didn't start using drugs and alcohol until late high school. In high school, I was class president and captain of the soccer team. And as I got more and more into drugs, my, I slowly you know, became less interested in everything else going on in my life. Um, but it took me about five years to find recovery. I entered recovery in Florida, and it was successful. Um, I was clean for nine months, and then I wasn't. I relapsed. Uh, I was. I used for about three months and then I got tired of it. I knew that there was an easier way and I knew that recovery was the answer. So I called up John here at the McShin Foundation and he said, you know, come home where the love is, you know, we'll figure it all out. And uh, I got here, I entered the McShin Foundation program, detox, cold turkey in four days. It was terrible, um, but it was memorable. Since it's peer to peer here at McShin, you know, if you want to run a group, you can run a group. And within a week or so, I was like, okay, like I, I want to do a group on, on whatever topic it was at the time, and I did it and slowly assumed more and more responsibility around here, and that grew into you know, tagging along with John on the trips that he does on a consistent basis, and it ended up in that trip to Houston, which you know, spot, you know, worked its way into what we currently have as McShin Academy. What does it mean when you apply yourself to McShin Academy is an alternative program for students who are in recovery from substance use disorder. So it's for high school age students, ages 14 to 18, who are trying to get off of using drugs and alcohol. Um, I was tired of seeing all my friends die and go off to jail, and I had, I'm in recovery as well, so I wish I had a program like what I saw in Texas you know, when I was in school. And so we started with one student. Um, his name is Andrew. He's now a staff member with us. And we grew to nine students by the end of the first semester. My story of recovery for me is I uh, started drinking and using drugs at 12 years old, 6th grade. You know, I kind of just wanted to find the next thing that would make me feel better about myself. And, um, you know, I always wanted to change the way I felt because I was never content with it. Slowly started progressing throughout middle school and um, towards the summer, toward beginning of ninth grade, I started using Xanax and hydrocodone. Started moving my way up and eventually just progressed into cocaine and LSD. and. It just kind of, it got out of control, you know, I tried different counselors, therapists, I tried to go to um, intensive outpatient programs, but nothing really worked for me. Couldn't go back to school because it's easier to find drugs in school than it is to be outside of school, you know, your dealers are just in your classes, they're sitting next to you, they're all around, and it was just not a healthy environment for me to be in, so I came back to the McShin Foundation and I stayed in one of the recovery houses. Stas Nowitzki um, came to my school and uh, kind of had a little intervention with me before I went off to rehab. So when I got out of rehab, I came here and it was just me and him in his office doing schoolwork. And then eventually we started progressing, you know, we had Joe come in and then other students following. And I first started using it as kind of a thing, like at first it was like kind of like the fit in kind of thing, but then like that lasted very, very shortly. And after that, it was just like, you know, I found the answer to all my problems. like. I don't have to feel feelings, you know what I mean? Like, I don't like feeling feelings. I don't know how to cope with them. I cope with them by doing stupid things, like breaking stuff or just like sitting in my own like misery. And then, you know, I got into drugs and like, 
You know, drugs like benzos, like they just completely checked me out so I didn't have to like think about anything, you know what I mean? Like I started off smoking weed and I was kind of like cool and I had fun with it, but then it was like, yeah, my thoughts are kind of, you know, blurred, but they're still there. But you know, like Xanax and the Klonopin and stuff like that, it just like checked me out and that's what I like because like I just hated my thoughts sitting with them and I didn't know how to deal with them, I guess. Like Mixion Academy gives me that space where I practice, you know, being emotional like in there and then I can apply it to like real life situations, you know what I mean? Like I'm not afraid to get vulnerable and that's through like Mixion Academy, like it gives me that space to practice that. Different events that happened to me in middle school just made me really insecure. So I, when I got into high school, I was introduced to drugs and um, I was able to like walk through the halls and not feel insecure when I was on something. Joe actually brought me into this. Um, I was out one night with some people and he made a phone call to my mom and just told her that I was doing this. And I came home that night and I was sitting in front of my mom and she was confronting me about everything. And I just sat there and I lied to her face. And I just felt like so guilty. I just like, I honestly just like did not want to feel that way anymore. So Joe was at his house with, a, with another student and they called me and just talked to me about McShin and what they were doing. And then the next day I just came here with them. The, the, the benefit of the school is that you're totally immersed and surrounded by people in recovery all day long. All of our staff are in recovery themselves, so we've been where these students are at. We know, where we know what they're going through. And typically our day is they come in, we run a feelings check, we run a morning meditation, a just for today group, um, kind of get a gauge of where everyone's at. And then we do their educational uh, curriculum. The teachers come in and teach them one-on-one -on -one for four to 10 hours a week, depending on their requirements for graduation. Um, and then we run recovery groups throughout the rest of the day and do fun activities and stuff like that. So it's important to show the students that they can have fun in recovery because if you're bored in recovery, you're gonna use. You know, it's not just recovery, recovery, recovery. Like we try to incorporate like life skills, you know, like we practice talking to each other. We'll sit down and have real conversations about what we want to do with our lives and talk about our feelings and that doesn't exist in high school. Public school, if you had an emotion, you would just put your head down and you would be scared to like tell anyone about it. And here I just feel comfortable with these people opening up and like they just make me feel like I can tell them anything and share any emotion with them. Whether we were arguing, or we were crying or we were laughing, you know, each thing brings us closer together because we're both sharing the same goal. Andrew has taken on a lot of responsibility in a short amount of time. For an 18-year-old, most 18-year-olds are out partying at college right now. You know, most of the people he graduated with. Andrew is giving back every single day. You know, that's an invaluable experience for the rest of his life. Um, you know, it gives him a sense of purpose that I don't think he'd be able to find anywhere else. Andrew used to have a beard and I listened to him a lot more then, but he shaved. <laughs> Two days ago now, I just kind of, he looks like a 15 year old, so I don't, I still listen to him, but not as much, but, but no, in all seriousness, it's just great having someone that's like been there, you know, like, he's been where we are, like, less than a year ago, so it's like, you know, like, it, it's cool to have, it's not, it's not someone like 40 years, 40 years old that went to college or 60 years studying this stuff to come in and tell me about it when they haven't experienced it themselves, like, He's been through it, you know, and he's gotten through it. Mick Shin is, uh, it's the last place I've stopped for help, and it's the only place that has worked for me. For me, this program just like, it just really helps. Like I wake up in the morning and I'm excited to go to school and I'm excited to be around these people. And it's, it's just a place I feel safe and just like, yeah. <laughs> when we're in active addiction, we don't think that we're useful at anything other than doing drugs. When we enter recovery, we can see that whatever we used, Every, in every moment up, up to that point in our lives um, that we can turn into something good. So as long as you're better than who you were yesterday and that's the only person you need to be better than, uh, you'll be okay. <laughs> to find out more about the McShin Foundation and its academy, go to mcshin.org and mcshinacademy.com. Virginia Currents TV programs can be seen anywhere, anytime at ideastations.org slash Virginia Currents. And to hear Virginia Currents radio stories, visit ideastations.org slash radio currents. It's time for a new segment called Daphne's Corner, where I have the privilege of meeting some of Virginia's standout artists. Joining us today is award-winning Cuban-American author Meg Medina.
Her books are for children of all ages and focuses on strong girls who overcome tough circumstances. She allows readers to explore the Latino culture and encourages the affirmation and celebration of the qualities of other cultures as well. In 2014, she earned a spot on the CNN 10 Visionary Women. Meg resides in Richmond, and when she's not writing, you can find her speaking across the nation and working on community projects that support girls, Latino youth, and literacy. Welcome, Meg, and thank you for joining us here on my inaugural oh, corner. It's quite an honor. Uh, tell me what fuels your passion for your stories. Mostly, it's family and culture. I'm really interested in where those two things intersect and how kids experience it. Uh, growing up in all of those moments where um, it comes, family and culture comes clashing, um, whether it's building them up or creates obstacles for them. And you grew up in a large family of women? I did, mostly women. I, you know, we chased them off. The men either died or <laughs> they were divorced or whatever, but mostly I grew up with my DS, my aunts and my grandmothers and my mother and my sister. So we were a house full of uh, immigrant women um, figuring New York City out in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. And what message do you want your books to engender in the readers? Mostly, I'm curious about resilience. I'm really interested in how it is that a young woman figures out how to advocate for herself, how to have a voice, um, how she draws strength from elder women around her. Um, so that is the message, resilience, how it is that we can have hard circumstances mm -hmm. and still um, come out ahead. And you emphasize culture, but you emphasize all the various cultures and not just your Latino culture. I do. I think that our country is just a mixed bag of lots of people. That's what our communities look like. So I like to write books that create a reflection of what our um, schools look like actually mm -hmm. for kids. Excellent. Now tell me you have a Medina scholarship. Tell me about that. I do. Most people know the Highlights Foundation through the Highlights Magazine at your dentist office. So it's a beautiful uh, place in Pennsylvania where writers go to study and uh, learn the craft. And this year I was their first artist in residence and they did me the great honor of establishing a scholarship in my name. And I'm really hoping that new writers, um, especially writers of color, writers who aren't typically represented in publishing in big numbers, that they will um, take a chance and apply for the scholarship. And encouraging writers who are multicultural as well. Mm -hmm. uh, do you encourage just female writers or? You're opening it up. No, I open it up. I mean, my particular interest is is the girl protagonist, but I think the beauty of writing is that everybody's story, when you, when you hit on the right story with someone, it really doesn't matter where they're from, not the country, not the gender. It's the universal. It's that feeling that this writer has said something that makes you stop and reconsider your own life. Thank you so much for joining us today, Meg. And to find out more about her work, check out her website at megmedina.com. Oh, please, don't make fun of me with my crooked smile. Today's spotlight on Virginia music shines on Lucy Dacus, a 21-year-old singer-songwriter who grew up in Mechanicsville, hometown to fellow musician Jason Mraz. Lucy Dacus has performed for NPR's Tiny Desk and has been named by Rolling Stone magazine as one of the top 10 new artists you need to know. Adopted at a young age, Lucy graduated from the prestigious Maggie Walker Governor School. As a student at VCU, she played around Richmond and was asked by current bandmate Jacob Blizzard to help him with some recordings for a college project. Those songs now make up the critically acclaimed album, No Burden, which was first released by Egg Hunt Records in Richmond and then re-released by Matador in the fall. Thanks for watching Virginia Currents. Please tune in next time for more inspiring stories. I'm Daphne Maxwell-Reed.
Two 